Earth's crust pushing up underneath the Rio Grande Rift in that area. And so it's an interesting place to find a river system integrated through there. Next slide. Uh, as we zoom in a little bit closer, one of the other interesting things about northern New Mexico in particular is this Jemez lineament. All of these black locations are volcanic fields uh, aligned very linearly. And so this is something that geologists have looked at for a while and been like, huh, well, that's kind of interesting. Wonder why that is. But northern New Mexico is, is noticeable as a geologist for a lot of volcanism in the area. And so this also feeds into uh, the history of the river. You can use that, those volcanics uh, to trace back the river system. It's also notice, noticeable for, again, this Rio Grande Rift system outlined in the, by the black dots, which is a series of big basins like the Albuquerque Basin, Santa Fe, Domingo Basin, and the Española Basin with pinch points in between. And the river integrates all of these basins downstream, kind of like pearls on a string until you get down past the Socorro Basin and into Basin and Range. So the questions that Marissa asked was how and when did the Rio Grande River become integrated from the San Juans down to the Gulf of Mexico? I gotta, I gotta switch this really quick. But I can actually see my slides. Um, how did sediment sources for the Rio Grande River and Chama uh, system evolve over the last six, over the last eight million years. When did it transition from aggradation, so filling up the rift, like around Albuquerque you see, and even driving up like past Camel Rock, you see a lot of these pink, like kind of loose rocks. That's all fill down in the basins um, that the Rio Grande River helped aggrade, fill up those basins with. And now it's actually incising in various places. And so there was a transition from aggradation, filling up that rift to incision and carving valleys. And then what were the respective roles of how the crust was moving around, that's tectonics, uh, changes in climate over the last 8 million years, and all of that volcanism up in the northern part of New Mexico and how all of that influenced the modern Rio Grande uh, into what we see today. So the main data sets that Marissa used for this study was looking at longitudinal river profiles. So like taking the elevation of the river all the way down uh, to the ocean along the profile of the river can actually tell you a lot about the history of that river. Dating, uh, so getting ages on basalts that were capping river gravels was actually one of the main ways that she looked at this. And so the, the basalt said that the river gravels had to be older than the age of the basalt. And then the crystals that you find inside that river gravel had to be older than the river gravel. And so you can bracket the age of the river gravel fairly effectively using a basalt on top of a river gravel. So we'll go into those methods really quick right now. So here's an example of a longitudinal river profile where here you've got the Rio Chama. This is the Taos Gorge. So upper box, lower box, middle box, and the Rio Conejo is confluence up here. And then here are the headwaters. You'll notice that the headwaters are steeper and then it shallows out. And so what an, what an equalized river profile looks like is a nice steep headwaters and gradually flattening out as it comes downstream. And so these steepness points right here, these are called nick points. And they're an indication of something that has messed with the river profile a little bit. And in this case, it's uh, the Taos Plateau basalts and all of the volcanism that happened up there. This is when you add this in, this is the upstream drainage area. And so when the Rio Chama flows in, you see there's a big kick in the amount of area that the Rio Grande River is draining. Same thing with the Rio Conejos confluence. Upstream from that, there's not a whole lot. Now, this is actually really important because it informs you how much water you have available to move sediment around. So down here, the river has a lot more carving power than it does up here because it has more water. However, the tools that the river uses to carve is sediment. Um, sorry. Uh, however, you also need steepness in order to carve. And so that's why you tend to see steep gorges in the headwaters of rivers, even though you don't have a lot of sediment and water to carve up there because you have all this energy 
from dropping in elevation. So here's a good question. Where did all that sediment come from? So the Rio Grande River is sourced up here in the San Juan volcanic field up near Wolf Creek Pass, if you're familiar with Southern Colorado. And one of the ways that you can figure that out is by collecting a bunch of samples along the river. And so all these little red numbers are samples that Marissa co collected in various basins. And most of those samples look like this, where you have a little tiny river channel of river gravels underneath one of these nice, beautiful basalt flows. So this is a four million year old basalt. Here's the modern river down here. And so sometime between four million years ago, or a little bit older than four million years ago, and now the river has carved this far down. So that's an idea of how you can figure out how fast this river is carving uh, into this basalt topography. So a couple of different ways that you can date this stuff. You can date the basalts using this argon-argon geochronology. You can date the uranium, uh, you can date the river sediments using the tridal zircon. So like cubic zirconium, the crystals, fake diamonds, that, that crystal occurs naturally in teeny, teeny, tiny little crystals that are basically indestructible. They're some of the oldest materials on the planet. And those are found in these river sands. And you can actually use those river sands as little tiny clocks uh, because they preserve how old they are and how old they, how long it took them to form. Um, so you'll find little tiny zircons in that sand in the trunk river sediment underneath the basalt. And then you'll also find sanidine crystals. And sanidine crystals are uh, crystals formed from volcanic activity like uh, in the Jemez, like the Valles Caldera, and also in the San Juan volcanic field. Like, so fairly silica-rich volcanism, um, but it's prevalent all over the southwestern US. There's a ton of different areas where you get this sanidine that will work its way into the river sands. And I saw, would somebody be willing, if there's any questions in the chat, to read them out to me as we go along? So sanidine is super, super precise in terms of getting dates. When you, so you date like a selection of a few hundred of these sand crystals, and you get basically what looks like a barcode of ages. And so we call these age populations. And so here in red, you see sanidine. And so right here, there's a really big population for this particular sample right at 35 million years ago. And there's one at 10.5 and one at 25 and one at 28. And then you also see in black age populations of the zircon. And so you can use these barcodes and the ages of these uh, crystals to trace back exact sources. So we know that sanidine is sourced from particular volcanic activity. We've got this age of 28.72. We can go find the volcano that erupted at 28.72 upstream in the headwaters of the Rio Grande or anywhere around this area and say, ah, that's where the river was sourced from, or like the river was getting sediment from this material at that point in time. And there we go. Here are some of those ages that might average out in the San Juan volcanic field of that, uh, which one was it? 28.72, somewhere in this area, or 27 million years ago. And here's the headwaters of the Rio Grande River. So you can actually trace out like, hey, it probably wasn't up here sourcing from this 32, because there wasn't a huge population of 32 million year old grains. And you can also say that it probably wasn't from necessarily the Latir volcanic field uh, because this volcanic activity was too young. You can say that it was flowing from the San Juan volcanic field at the age of that particular river gravel, which was a little bit older than 4 million years ago. So we know that the Rio Grande River was flowing through the area of northern New Mexico by 4 million years ago. So that's just a basic overview of the methods that she used. Um, and I'll go over some of what she found out. So here's one of those longitudinal profiles. You can see a bunch of the, and this is the upstream section. Uh, well, I guess it goes all the way down to Big Bend. Um, 
So you can see the Conejos is up here, the Rio Chama is here and enters right in here. Here's the Red River, nice and steep. Uh, here's the Rio Grande Gorge. This red indicates the top of the gorge and here's White Rock Canyon. So these are the canyons that were carved. Albuquerque's here, Socorro's here. Here's the Jemez coming in um, and the Rio Puerco. And here's that major nick point of the Cows Gorge. We got a little bit of interference if uh, we can make sure that folks are muted. So she included some of the faults along this area and some of the very specific basalts that she did actually date through here. Um, so here's the Taos Plateau, associated really nicely with that nick point uh, in the upper Rio Grande River system. Remember about something today. So um, these are some of the historic ages that were compiled of basalts across the Taos Plateau and volcanic activity across the Taos Plateau. Rinconada is right here just to get people oriented and Espanol is down here. Here's the Chama and the Rio Grande River. Uh, these stars are areas where she collected samples. Um, again, she also collected some samples down in the White Rock Canyon and stuff like that. Here's the John Don Bridge. And you notice that most of the ages of the basalts across this area are somewhere in the three to four million year old range. So, these are these barcodes that she was looking at uh, here in red highlighted. This is that activity from the San Juan volcanic field. And so a lot of the material is sourced from right around the San Juan volcanic field based off of those ages. These are these uh, upper Taos Plateau, upstream of uh, the Jemez Mountains. So Albuquerque's here, Santa Fe would be somewhere right around here. Here's Española uh, at the Rio Chama confluence. And so most of this is upstream of the Rio Chama River. Almost all of this is sourced from the headwaters in the San Juan Mountains. And most of this is found below those 4 million year old basalts. We look at, um, so if you add up all those ages as you go back in time, you can see uh, cumulative age summaries of those crystals in the sand. And this is mostly for zircon. So here's the modern Rio Grande upstream of the Red River and the ancestral Red River and the modern Red River. And so these look very, very similar. And most of the rest of these look very, very different downstream of there. So that's indicating that uh, there was actually a difference in basins between the upstream and the downstream sections. So if we, she took a closer look here at Black Mesa. So again, this is the Rio Chama and uh, Rio Grande confluence. And so Pilar is like right here. Uh, and this is that little mesa right next to Pilar. So this is actually the stretch right along the race course. So this is one of the samples that she did. This is what some of the data looks like in its um, mostly raw form. Uh, and what she found was that there are a number of ages of basalts in this area. This is that ancestral Red River, I believe. Um, yeah, and here's, here's Rinconada and Velarde. So the race course would be a little bit upstream from this stretch along Black Mesa. But as she looked at this, she actually saw that along here, there's a series of river gravels underneath the salts that get younger as you get to the modern Rio Grande River. And so this Rio Grande River, four million years ago, was flowing up here, and then it moved down, and then it moved a little bit further still, and then it finally fell into the valley that it's currently in along the Embudo Fault. And so this is kind of a cool story of like, oh, well here you can see it's a little bit higher and that basalt's a little bit older. And the basalts are getting younger. And so these basalts are actually pushing the river a little bit further to the south and flowing into the river valley, damming up the river valley. The river then overtops that basalt, tears it up and continues carving a little bit further down. 
And here's the modern Rio Grande River here. And this Ojo Caliente sandstone, this is some of that basin fill that the Rio Grande was filling all the basins up with. So you can put this together in kind of a story where here's that Rio Grande River system on the northern side of Black Mesa. Eight million years ago, the Rio Chama was probably dominating the system. Uh, by 2.6 million years ago, the Rio Grande was dominating the system and it was shifting further and further south. I'm going to check the chat really quick. Um, Joey, I saw you mentioned earlier, it is possible to determine the rate that sediment flows downstream. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, but basically you put in sediment catches in the system or put in cameras uh, and you can get a decent estimate. Yeah, thanks Scott. Cool. And then this continues moving further south. You can start seeing, and these, these uh, detrital graphs over here on the left are just showing, hey, it's picking up different, different bits of sediment as you're, as you're aging. So here you're, this is one sample. This is how you're telling, this is how you can tell that it's starting to pick up more from the San Juan volcanic field and that the uh, Rio Grande is more dominant is because you've got this major peak from the San Juan volcanic field coming in through right there. And then of course it's moving a little bit further south down Black Mesa as you get younger and younger. So if we look at the Red River, there's, um, there's some historical literature that considers the upper, uh, yeah, so you can see the historic Red River through right there and the Rio Trauma right here. So this is what the modern Red River looks like. It's very singularly sourced specifically from this teeny tiny little area, uh, which looks very similar to the Fish Canyon Tuck, which is a major eruption up here in the San Juan Mountains. So, this is basically looking at a story of the spillover of Lake, of Lake Alamosa. If you guys have driven up into Antonito or areas like that, you'll notice that this whole area between the Sangre de Cristos and the San Juan Mountains, there's this big, wide, flat valley. And that was a big lake. So that was Lake Alamosa. Um, and so Lake Alamosa was stalling the Rio Grande River at 430,000 years ago. Now we know that some of this material was already making it down here by 4 million years ago. And so something was damming this up and separating these two, possibly drying out of the climate, possibly uh, changing of the topography. And then eventually it spilled over and drained Lake Alamos and now the Rio Grande River flows through that area. So, a couple of things there's that- one, Carmen, there's one question. Sorry, there's one question in the chat with regards to uh, any links to the monastery area study. Um, I, can, I can speak to that, Carmen. I was- Yeah, Scott, I was gonna say, you know more about that than I do. Yeah, I was invited in on a Chama water uh, uh, meeting the other day and, and I just made introductions. I didn't say a whole lot, but uh, I learned a lot. And uh, they were talking about some high-tech equipment that they've installed at the monastery, partly because of the topography of the area. Um, it's a, a good place to study. It kind of settles right there at the monastery, if you're familiar with that area. But also the security of it. The the monks can keep an eye on their on their equipment, equipment. that's in that area. <laughs> and uh, there's less chance of, of damage or vandalism to some of the equipment there. But what they're trying to do is study what flows are required to clear the fine sediment from the fish reeds uh, versus 
higher flows that tend to push the fish eggs and coarser gravels downstream and destroy things. So there's a fine line that they're really trying to study and, and they learn a lot from every even natural high flow event. Uh, they're kind of finishing up a high flow event of 1500 CFS, a release from Chama or from El Vado right now. Um, part of that is is to gather data from this equipment that they have at the monastery. We don't have any data to share with you at this time, but um, maybe that'll be available to the public soon. Yeah, and there's a fair number of stories out, uh, studies out there trying to quantify sediment flow and what it takes to actually move sediment. Uh, there's been a bunch of stuff up in Northern California actually, where they've lined the banks of the river uh, with uh, seismometers and then basically cut all of the water off to the river, dumped a bunch of gravel in, had cameras and sediment traps all the way down the river, and then kicked up the water and varied the flow to see how sediment moved at varying flows. And I think some of that material has been published. So It's been, it's been really interesting recently, places like Lake Powell and even El Vado, uh, with the lake levels dropping, uh, you can float clear water into the lake basin and all of the sediment is calving off and the mm -hmm. water actually gets muddier at the lake. Normally it settles out at a lake, but with all the calving sediment, and it sounds like gunshots and glaciers falling into the river when these sediment banks fall in. But Same thing happens uh, down in Lake Mead and Lake Powell actually at the bottom of yeah. Grand Canyon and Cataract. Right, yeah, there by Dirty Devil. Uh, yep. It's really been interesting to see how that's evolved over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Right. So back to uh, what drove the Rio Grande River integrating downstream. This is a map of um, it's monsoon intensity. So it comes right up the Rio Grande Rift, but it ends up shifting a little bit east. So this probably isn't a very good uh, option to drive this river integration that Marissa found uh, through time. And there was some previous work looking at the river basins that I can share with you guys later if you're interested. I've got it at the end of this presentation. And that previous work is what she based a lot of her research on where they were finding evidence of the Rio Grande River integrating along these basins, moving from upstream to downstream through time. Uh, Right, so the next option would be maybe onset of American glaciation, which happened, at least in North America, the latest glaciation happened um, Yeah, so here's that, here's that spillover, so it's relatively dry. This is in thousands of years. So add another three zeros to this. So this is 2.5 million years uh, in terms of when major glaciation was happening. Each one of these like spikes and sinks right here is one of those 100,000 year ice ages that we talk about. Uh, and so here's the most recent one. Cooling and then spiking with the most, most recent temperature increases. Uh, so 4.5 million years ago, this is when that Rio Grande is integrating down to southern New Mexico. Pretty dry, no significant changes right here. So this also probably is not a very good uh, driver of integrating that river downstream. So with, if we look at the more recent timing at 430,000 years ago instead of 4.5 million years ago, we do see increased wetness and increased uh, precipitation around the end of this glaciation period. Uh, so that could be a driver for the lake spilling over, but it's not a good, obviously, wrong timing for 4.5 million years ago. Um, 800,000 years ago is about when the Rio Grande transitioned from aggrading those basins up to back, in, back to incising. But it has been carving canyons for a while. So I'm going to skip over this really quick because but basically, she didn't find a good correlation between climatic forcings and incision for the Rio Grande River. What she did find was that 
at the same time of the integration, around 4 million years ago, there was a ton of volcanism up in the northern New Mexico area. That heat, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, would have forced the area to be a little bit higher in elevation, and so it would have actually uplifted uh, northern New Mexico and would have given a little bit more steepness uh, to the drainage of the river, and that would have helped drive spillover of these basins. And so you'd have spillover from uh, lakes in the Alamosa Basin, not Lake Alamosa 430,000 years ago, we're talking 4 million years ago, you'd have spillovers from a lake into that. That volcanism would be tilting the surface of the area southward because you're focusing volcanism in that area. And so the water would want to run southwards more effectively over top a lot of those valleys and continue to integrate all the way through southern New Mexico. So if you've got, yeah, and that's basically what this is talking about is that you've got a zone of uplift due to heat right here. And the forcing of that is gonna drive a little bit of subsidence in this area. And so you're gonna see a bowing up of the river profile along right here from the headwaters through right here and down. And this is exactly what you see in the Taos Gorge area is that you see this increased steepness of slope through that area. Which coincides with the river integrating through the area. So based off of her conclusions, again, here's that longitudinal river profile. Here's the Texas, New Mexico border. Here's the New Mexico, Colorado border. Here's the Rio Grande Gorge, Taos Gorge, White Rock Canyon right here, Albuquerque, uh, and on south. So as we look at this, she's got a map right here showing basically all of these lakes at 8.6 8 to 6 million years ago. So there was probably a lake in the Albuquerque Basin. This is when a lot of this area is aggrading. The Rio Chama is probably dominating uh, based off of the sediment sources down in White Rock Canyon. And almost all of these basins are like internally drained. So they're sourcing from the mountains directly around them, but there's no through going flow. There's just flow from the immediate area just surrounding it. And you probably have the Red River flowing into the Chama and the Rio Embudo. You probably don't have a solid connection here uh, just because you aren't seeing a huge population of those San Juan Mountain grains coming through into the White Rock Canyon area and into Northern New Mexico. Now, at this point in time, you start seeing a little bit of volcanism happening. And so the Jemez liniment is gonna be pushing this area up right here. And so you start building that Rio Grande Gorge, the Taos Plateau basalt here. And here you're steepening the Rio Grande River headwaters around 5 million years. You're starting to get the, an incipient Rio Grande River as you're steepening these headwaters because you're uplifting that Jemez Liniment area, which is right across right here. Uh, you're starting to integrate through along those lakes downstream. Probably still haven't integrated with Lake Alamosa and the Rio Grande River yet, though. Moving forward to about 2 million years, more volcanism. Probably still haven't integrated yet, but you're still really forcing this river to integrate all the way downstream. This is the point in time when you're starting to build like White Rock Canyon, more of the Rio Grande Gorge is being built. And you notice that this whole profile is lifting up and the Chama is kind of subsiding in comparison. And so this is why the Rio Grande River is becoming more dominant over the source of the Rio Chama is because of this uplift and pushing this whole, whole river profile up in elevation a little bit. 1.2 million years, a little bit further forward in time. 0.8, this is when the Valle Caldera eruptions are occurring. Also at 1.2. The Rio Grande is working really hard to incise through these Taos Plateau volcanics. This is also when it's arriving at the Gulf of Mexico. This is when you first see sediment from the Rio Grande River arrive in the Gulf of Mexico is about, about a million years ago to 800,000 years ago. 
probably still haven't integrated with that uh, like Alamos yet. And then you have the modern Rio Grande, you start seeing a major influx of San Juan volcanic field stuff. And here's our modern river profile at this point in time, where it's actually kind of overtaken the Rio Chama. So, uh huh? I forget who said they wanted to read the comments, I mean, the questions, but Joey asks whether it would be inaccurate to say pressure from underneath the Earth's crust is pushing up the Pilar Cliffs. The which cliffs? Pilar's cliffs. Pilar cliffs? So it's not necessarily pressure. Um, it's it's a it's it's broad scale buoyancy. So it's not necessarily pushing up the Pilar Cliffs. Uh, it's broad scale, long wavelength buoyancy that's just pushing up all of northern New Mexico, particularly under the more volcanically active areas, like specifically in the Rio Grande Rift system. So between the Sangre de Cristos and the drainage divide between the Rio Grande and the Rio Chama, um, me see if I can't find. So if we look at this map really quick, there's a drainage divide right here um, that has the, so the Valles Caldera is right here, but there's a bunch of basement cord uplifts. So older uplifts that are separating the Rio Chama and the Rio Grande. And in the Rio Grande area, specifically in this valley right here, between that uplift and the Sangre de Cristos in the Taos Valley, um, this is in the Rio Grande Rift. And so this is where the volcanism is really highly concentrated. You don't have that much volcanism in the headwaters of the Rio Chama. Most of that is sedimentary soft rocks. So basically, Marissa's hypothesis with her master's thesis is that because of the volcanism in this area specifically, along this Jemez lineament, uh, it's forcing this area up a little bit. So it's not uplifting. Uh, uplifting the Pilar Cliffs specifically isn't necessarily true, uh, but uplifting the whole landscape is true. And so it's steepening the headwaters of the Rio Grande River through this area at this time. Does that make sense? Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, and Paul, if you want to chip in, I know you helped Marissa out on, on this project a bit. I think you did anyways. So like I said, I wasn't promising smoothness because I'm pulling this out of a lot of memory. <laughs> So her main conclusions uh, were that the San Juan volcanic field has been a primary sediment source for the Rio Grande as, since as early as 5 million years. That's when you start to see some of that material in there. The uplift of the Taos Plateau from that volcanism, like we were just talking about, because you were uplifting headwaters, you were driving downward integration of various lakes and the basins in the Rio Grande rift, like pearls on a string. Uh, you're lifting up the headwaters, and each one of those pearls spills over down to the next one, all the way down through southern New Mexico. Uh, this confluent shifted at least 50 kilometers upstream between 2.6 and 1.6 MA because of the Jemez Mountains being built. So that big caldera being built from volcanism is pushed, again, a little bit from thermal uplift and a little bit from building the Jemez Mountains. Uh, push that confluence upstream uh, while that volcano was active. And then later, the one million year downward integration to the Gulf was a result of both the uplift in the headwaters, there's still ongoing volcanism along the Jemez lineament, and some climatic forcings because about about 5 million years ago, and especially in the last 2 million years, you've seen a lot of variation in the cyclicity of the climate, uh, which means that you've got some periods that are a lot wetter than others. 
And then the about 400,000 year old spillover of Lake Alamosa was a reintegration of the Rio Grande drainage. Uh, possibly also due to climate, probably due to magmatic forcings. Um, and we have an ongoing river incision rate of about 100 to 150 meters per million years, depending on where you're at. As a combination of the erosive climate, so we've got an arid climate. We're not weathering a lot of material. Weathering requires rain. And we're con seeing continued uplift in the area uh, from volcanism and tectonic activity. So I will try to take more questions. Um, and if you guys want me to go through some more stuff on basin integration and stuff like that, I absolutely can. And feel free to unmute yourself for questions as well. Carmen, this is Scott. I can talk a lot faster than I can type. <laughs> sure. This is Marissa, by the way, doing field work. I I had a question about uh, some of the minerals that are found around Talos Junction Bridge. The it's not the Apache Cross, some kind of star. There's a specific mineral right there around Talos Junction bid, Bridge. Can anybody shed light on that? Can you describe it? It's a little it's mineral. Starlight. It's a cross. Oh, starlight. Yeah. So those are starlight twins. Um, so that's typically found in the schist of that area. So that that's what's in um, there's a, in that particular area. There's kind of three main rocks. Uh, there's the basalts uh, from the Talos Plateau. There's schists, and then there's quartzites, which quartzite is named after. Uh, and the schists and the quartzites are both about 1.7 billion years old. And they were formed from being pressurized and cooked down deep. And then they were brought up to the surface along the Embudo Fault, which runs through that area. Um, and those starlight crystals are minerals that grow under those high temperature, high pressure conditions and twins that are perpendicular. There's a shiny blue mineral right around Big Rock, too, that's called kyanite, that is also pretty indicative of those high pressure and temperature conditions. Carmen, I think Paul Bauer dropped, but he could back this up. But I believe Big Rock is a fractured, massive starlight. Uh, Check no, Big, Big Rock is basalt. There, there's a lot of beautiful starlight in some of the rocks along shore at Big Rock, um, but the Big Rocks themselves in the river, those are all basalt. Are any of the formations that we see in the river actually bedrock, or is it all um, debris that's fallen down off the sides into the river? Pretty much all debris, uh, especially yeah. in young rivers like the Rio Grande River, like five, five million years old is young. It's the same age as the Grand Canyon. Um, some, of the, some of the rivers out on the East Coast are like 200 million years old, 100 million years old kind of ridiculousness. Because um, the Appalachians are such old mountains. So young rivers typically have really angular blocks. Uh, and it's typically just stuff falling into the river as the river is cutting down. Uh, young rivers are typically quite significantly steeper as well. How about Yellow Bank? Is there any significance to that? the name of that? Is there a specific geological feature there or mineral at Yellow Bank? I honestly have no idea. A lot of times in these basalt flow areas, you do see old soils that are trapped between the basalt flows. Usually that's pretty, usually those are pretty red. Um, so, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. That's kind of just conjecture. Yeah, Ian mentioned in the chat, it could be a hydrothermal deposit. That's possible. There's a lot of hot springs in the area and sulfur is pretty yellow. So 
if there's an old hydrothermal deposit in that area, uh, I could see there being sulfur. I'd have to get out on the bank and walk around and look. I'm fortunate enough to have a couple of geology friends that work in the drilling industry, but um, we go rafting with them in Canyon Lands and Grand Canyon a lot. And I've learned so much from them and it's always interesting to see a, or hear a geologist perspective and interpretation <laughs> of, sure. of all the areas. I see there's a couple more questions in the chat. Joey, uh, so the pink rock on the right below Big Rocks is actually some of that quartzite in the area. It's the only place where it's exposed along the river. And if you go look at it really closely, you'll notice that it's like super chewed up and fractured. And so, uh, that's actually an area where the Embudo Fault is really close to the river. And I'll go back to a map really quick. If you get a chance, you want to talk about the sloughing uh, of yeah. the, the hill there at uh, Sow's Hole? And why it oh, yeah, there's a good landslide there, I think. OK, so this, this black line right here, this is the Embudo Fault. And so this is a step over where the Rio Grande Rift is going from we're playing the big map. Here we go. So the Albuquerque value, you notice that the Rio Grande Rift is, it's, there's this north-south valley from Albuquerque to Socorro, and then it takes this big step over to the east right here, and then it's a north-south valley all the way up to the San Luis Basin. The Embudo Fault is accommodating the step right of this whole system, and so the, this is a system where it's trying to split the crust underneath North America, and so in order to jump over, you have to have a fault accommodating that split. Uh, and so the Embudo Fault actually helps to expose some of that quartzite right along the bank, uh, just below Big Rocks, basically right above After Five. Between Big Rock and After Five, that pink rock is more or less an exposure of fault rock from the Embudo Fault. Um, there were more chats. So this work was done in uh, she started in 2014. She finished in 2016, I think. Um, she's since completed a PhD and is now working up at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in the Bay Area. Uh, she did her PhD in Potsdam, Germany, um, actually on rivers in South America. And I believe it's been published. Uh, I'd have to go double check the journal, but I'm almost certain that it's been published. And it would have been published somewhere around 2016, 2017. Well, Carmen, I, I thank you. I think you put all these high tech geology terms into uh, common knowledge or common language. That I hope so. I hope I didn't. I hope it wasn't that I can understand. Good job. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, that was kind of my goal. Um, these are some of the, the basin studies where they were identifying. Uh, so like here's Española and Santo Domingo, Albuquerque, uh, stuff like that. This is where they were identifying the Rio Grande River downwardly integrating. So you see river gravel show up through time. Uh, so this is how we know that it was downwardly integrated. But. I've heard at one time that, that the Albuquerque Bosque Valley here, um, there was a huge uh, differential between the river valley and the Sandia Peaks and basically the Sandias have eroded in to fill in that same valley. Otherwise we would have a huge 10,000 foot deep gorge here in Albuquerque. Yeah, so the Albuquerque Basin is one of the deepest basins along the Rio Grande Rift and it's like 25 kilometers deep of sediment, 10, 10 kilometers deep of sediment, just straight down underneath our feet, which is a little bit absurd. It gives us a, a great aquifer opportunity though. <laughs> um, it fills in with water and that's where we draw our water from. Yeah, yep.
Yeah, hard water. There's a lot of calcite in that <laughs> aquifer. Do you know anything, this is kind of off topic, but do you know anything about the geothermal activity around San Ysidro and some of the old springs and how the plate seems to be shifting and the springs are shifting? Uh, yeah, so I do know a bit about that area, actually. We've done uh, field work out in that area, looked at some of those springs, and basically they're, they're mostly just moving downward into the valley as the valley is carved out a little bit more is my impression. Um, most of the spring deposits up the hill, uh, you're talking about like in White Mesa area? Yeah, from White Mesa to the north, if you look at Google Maps and it's on tribal land, so we can't promote any exploration of it, but there's actually some craters out there, old dry springs that are mm -hmm. 30 foot across, 30 feet deep. There's some amazing crystal formations down in little, uh, oh pockets in those areas but uh, there's still active springs in that area and they they seem to be shifting even the Spence hot springs up in the Hamus uh, the water is not as um, it doesn't flow as much it's not as hot so that spring seems to be affected by uh, things moving around even in our lifetime yeah and actually there's they've looked at some of the areas where they're there's like travertine quarries from springs along the Rio Grande Rift uh, and figured out from fractures in the travertine that the rift is actually still moving very, very slowly. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I believe Albuquerque could see as big as like a magnitude five earthquake, magnitude six earthquake on, on the fault that's along the front side of the Sandias. Uh, it's not very likely, probably won't happen in our lifetimes, but it is a possibility just because the rift is still actively very slowly spreading apart. So, um, but yeah, with San Isidro, I think that that's just a matter of the springs moving downstream. A lot of the springs are actually, actually have water sourced from the Jemez Mountains, which has always been kind of weird and interesting to me. It's, they're working their way down along the fault, along the faults along the Nacimientos. Uh, we did a drone mapping project out there on the springs and travertines, so, which was kind of fun. Definitely crashed a couple drones. <laughs> we were out there in the wind and it ran out of batteries and so we flew into the cliff right at our feet. <laughs> well, we are fortunate to live in a, a very exciting area, not just geology, but uh, outdoor wise. It gives mm -hmm. us some in, gives us a lot of interesting things to explore. Definitely, for sure. Well, if there's no more questions, I might stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you, Carmen. That was a very good uh, presentation. Yeah, sorry if it was a little rough. <laughs> I literally <laughs> just got the slides on Saturday. I emailed Marissa last week and was like, all of my other connections disappeared. Can I do your thesis? Well, you did an excellent job. Uh, I'm a geologist, but I've um, most of my work has uh, been other places in the world. Yeah, this is a great time to open it up to anybody else out there that's got some interesting comments or uh, can add to what Carmen has shared with us tonight.